The webinar will begin shortly. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, good evening out there, you said. This is uh, Dr. Brown. We are starting up one more um, a semester in class. So to those of you who are joining us again as repeat customers, welcome back. And to those new people, I'm welcoming you to the family here. Hopefully you'll have as much fun as we are having uh, getting some learning done. <clears throat> Excuse me. So let's see. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the basics that we'd like to cover first. I think I'll show you the. Um, we'll talk real quickly about the syllabus, okay? Um, how that is arranged. So let me pull that up. <clears throat> Just one moment. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. So, let's take a look at the syllabus here. And so you'll notice that we meet, <coughs> excuse me, that we meet on um, Tuesday nights. Um, on eight from eight thirty until ten. Uh, this actually is Tuesday and Thursday. We mostly just meet once per week. <clears throat> Tuesday and Thursday is the board review class that comes uh, right after this one. So we're going to meet on uh, Tuesday evenings, <coughs> and it's a sixteen week course. Um, it's the first of a two-part course. Now, there are, I know that there are those of you who already took one physiology course with me. So you're thinking, well, this is the second. Um, yeah, what you actually took was part two, where we just, it's a matter of language. You know, it's the fall semester, so we call that the first semester. So you're not getting the same stuff over again. You're getting different stuff, don't worry. And... <coughs> The way that I've designed it, it's, as it says, it's for the full-time employed graduate student that has previous academic exposure to the subject matter. So the idea is that it's targeted right towards you guys. My point is uh, I'm trying to cover it quickly enough so that those of you who are moving through the program in that 18-month to 24-month time period, I'm trying to cover it quickly enough. <coughs> excuse me, so that you are uh, ready for the boards, but slowly enough so that uh, you're able to grasp uh, the stuff that, that you might have been missing in your, your prior years of, of clinical practice. And as always, we will include some study techniques and test-taking strategies and this kind of thing. <clears throat> That's just uh, my habit. On this one, we're going to have a midterm and a final. Uh, you'll notice that's one more exam than the last term, and it's simply because I figured, and I may be wrong, but I figured you guys might appreciate not letting your entire grade hang on one test. You know, this gives you a chance to kind of uh, get up to speed on any learning curve that might get thrown at you. <clears throat> so, let us take a peek at what this semester is going to look like. What I did, guys, is I tried to um, make, just as, as last term, 
I tried to make the topic, the subject matter, parallel what's going on in the on-site classes. That way you would have this redundancy, you'd have you know, four passes, uh, you'll be able to talk about, <coughs> excuse me, for instance, gastroenterology, not only in the webinar, but you'll talk about it from a physiology point of view, from an anatomy point of view. Uh, also, you'll see it on the on-site, and then you'll see it in the dissection. So you, you know, you get to think about each topic four times. So what you see up here is a a rough uh, approximation of how the USAT on-site lectures will be going, and I have uh, tried to match it pretty much with that. <clears throat> so that said, we have um, three weeks of GI, two weeks of cardio, and then a midterm. And then we have what is really going to be four weeks of hematology. However, um, each week we're really studying something different. So uh, we'll be talking about red blood cells one week, white blood cells another week, lymphocytes a third week. <coughs> And then we get into neurology, which I've broken down into uh, three weeks. One of neurotransmitters, one of uh, the CNS, the central nervous system, and then one week of the peripheral nervous system, which takes us to the end of the semester, review for the final, and have the final. Now with regard, for, with regard to the review, just like last term, and it seemed to work out well, my plan is to give a review and um, make available the slide deck from that review. And my intention is that you would be able to, if you've been keeping up with the reading of your slides over the semester, you should be able to answer all of your exam questions from that um, slide deck. That's not to say every answer would be on there, it, because, uh, like I said, the assumption is that you've read the background of the slides. I don't mean textbooks, I just mean reading the slides. <coughs> but, excuse me, but the exams will come 100% from the semester slides and more, um, more focused, I guess I could say, from the review slides. Okay, so pay attention to the slides. Pay attention to the red on the slides for those of you who are new. Those of you who are not, you know the deal. <clears throat> All right, so there we go. Um, I think that is it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, any questions out there? Uh, will this be posted? Yes, the, the syllabus will be posted by admin on our new website. Uh, and they will post it on the Google Drive, you know, just like they would the rest of the, uh, the, um, the um, information that comes across uh, that we deliver um, class-wise, I guess is what I'm thinking of. Uh, website, yes, the uh, admin is building a USAT, a new USAT website. I haven't seen it. I just know that they keep asking things from me <laughs> to put on it. One of them is, uh, <clears throat> they said that I guess they're going to show, you know, they want to advertise to the world what, what the classes are like and uh, how we learn. So I can't tell you any more than that. Unfortunately, I don't know. But either uh, Jeff and or Cena should probably be able to give you more information. Alrighty, with that, <coughs> let's go ahead and jump into the lecture. Let's see. Let me switch pages here. Uh, no, I have not <coughs> received your grades from your final. Once they get graded, I assume they'll pass them on to the 
and I told him that I would like you to have a, uh, an opportunity to do corrections on those finals, just like any of the other tests, because even more so, you only had one chance last semester to make a grade. So uh, <clears throat> I will update you when they hit my inbox. <clears throat> All right, let us see. Let's talk about a little GI, shall we? Okay, and um, as normal, at least I would like to make it normality that when we do this, uh, the A30 class, that, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, I think all of my class, no, I do have a 7 o'clock class. Anyway, that has nothing to do with what I'm about to say. So what I'd like to do, if you guys don't mind, is with this, uh, this A30 to 10 o'clock class is just push right through without a break, which means that we would uh, end about 9, um, yeah, 9.45 at night <clears throat> instead of waiting for a break and going on over the 10. All right, so let's get started. Let's talk about some GI. <clears throat> All okay, so you are pretty much used to talking about the gastro, well, the GI, the gastrointestinal system. Um, we are going to cover it in our couple of sessions all the way from the oral cavity down to the anus and the rectum. <clears throat> Excuse me, my plan is just to go in the order as far as the, the elementary tube. Just go in the order that we, that we encounter it. And so, which means we're going to be talking about tongue, oral pharynx, esophagus, and we'll get caught up a little when we get to the, the stomach and the duodenum and ileum and jejunum, small intestine. Uh, we'll spend some time looking at exactly how those cells work, uh, especially the, the ones that are responsible for the secretary functions of the body. And we will spend some time talking about each of the so-called uh, GI organs pancreas, gallbladder, <clears throat> looking at those uh, individually, okay? So, let's start out here. Functions of the GI tract. So, we are going to center around four main functions. There are more. These are the ones I'd like you to be concerned with. One of the functions of the GI tract is motility. Of course, it's got to move the food through, right? And then there's uh, secretions. The idea is <clears throat> now that I have food in the system and my GI tract has been able to move it along, uh, now I have to prepare to uh, break this stuff down so that I can digest it. This is where secretion comes in. Secretion is for the purpose of digestion, which takes us to the third function. Um, I have those enzyme, those uh, digestive enzymes that have been secreted. Now I am able to digest this food, you know, to say it's broken down into the, the um, absorbable, bioavailable molecules. And that takes us to the fourth function, which is the absorption, specifically of nutrients, <coughs> electrolytes, and urine. Okay, so motility, secretion, digestion, and absorption. <clears throat> so the overall structure, you know, I think the best way to, to think about this whole GI tract is think about the tube and then think about the organs that kind of come in almost as, a, as an afterthought. There's the mouth, the esophagus, stomach, small intestine, large intestine, and the anus. 
with regard to the other specialized organs, the salivary glands, pancreas, liver, and gallbladder. Okay. We'll cover those uh, in agonizing detail as the days come. So let's talk about some of the layers of the GI tract. The innermost layer is called the mucosa. When we say innermost, we're talking about the side that faces the lumen. And <clears throat> this is one of those areas that tends to get us tripped up every now and then. What what do we mean when we say the epithelial surface of a lumen? So, well, of a tube. Uh, so, uh, keep in mind that when we say epithelial, we're talking about that surface that faces the lumen of the tube. That layer, okay? That is the mucosal layer. Submucosal just means that we are we're inside that tube now, and now we're just going to go deeper. Right? So as we sink one level deeper, we encounter submucosal layer. This is collagen, which is just a fancy word for connective tissue. Elastin, it is what it sounds like. Uh, it is what, what helps with the, the uh, tone of the um, submucosa when we get ready to talk about peristalsis and moving, moving through, propelling fluid forward through the tract. Glands, those are the ones that are going to do that secretion function that we just talked about two slides ago. And then, of course, uh, at the end of the day, it is a part of the body, so it needs to be infused with blood, with the blood vessels. Now, let's talk about some of the smooth muscle here on number three. You have some circular and some longitudinal. Now, both of those are responsible for motility. Now, when you think circular, guys, I want you to imagine uh, a water hose with a with a uh, <clears throat> excuse me a golf ball inside of it. And uh, let's say that you're trying to propel that golf ball through the water hose. If you wrap your fingers around the water hose and kind of just squeeze that golf ball forward, that would be the circular muscles. Uh, the longitudinals would be longitudinal. They're basically running along the length of the water hose, <clears throat> excuse me, as opposed to going around it. Those two types of muscles, circular and longitudinal, are what make up that phenomenon of peristalsis, uh, the moving of the fluid through the tube. And then finally we have the serosa. This is the layer that faces the blood. <clears throat> so we've traveled all the way from inside where the lumen is to the blood where the uh, vasculature is. And this is just a nice pretty picture of the same thing we just talked about. So I'm going to get out my little colored pen and we will take a look here. This here is the epithelial layer. So if this is epithelial, then you know that this area here where I'm coloring it green, that's the lumen, okay? So there's food that will be moving through here. And to get you oriented, uh, imagine, <coughs> imagine a tube, a water hose, a piece of intestine going directly into your screen and coming directly out at you, towards you in a way that you can like put it up to your eye and look all the way down. And then you cut that off, right? Just um, cut that in half so that you're still looking down the tube. And this will be the, the um, <coughs> from, from which you would be looking at that. So the uppermost is going to be that epithelial surface that we talked about. And then just beneath that is going to be what we call the lamina propria. Okay, so that's here, and you can see how much space that really takes up, area, I should say. But no, below the lamina, lamina propria is the muscularis mucosae, that is this blue area right here. And we're going to talk about these individually in just a moment. Submucosa just below that. And then we're going to have... Um, 
just below that, this blue area is the circular muscle that we just talked about with its responsibilities in peristalsis. Circular muscle, which is uh, border, it's bordered on its um, superior side by the semicostal plexus and its inferior side by the myotarian plexus. Okay, uh, which are the the nervous innervations to the body. We come down to the gray area and we have some long, longitudinal muscles. That's that second set that we just mentioned. The peristalsis and then finally the bottom level, which is what's facing the blood, the serosa. Okay, so you do need to be familiar with all these layers, guys. Um, mostly because um, when we start talking about pathophysiology and we start talking about things going wrong and antibodies and different disease processes, uh, you will need to be able to visualize where this stuff is going on. And when we're talking about, you know, I don't know eight or nine names, basically. So if you can just master these eight or nine names, you will be well set for the GI tract as far as anything that would affect it because you've covered them all. Innervation to the GI tract. So there's two major systems that innervate it. The first is, well, they both come up under the autonomic nervous system. One of them is extrinsic, the other one is intrinsic. Okay, so um, I'd say this is probably one of those slides, I'm trying to think, out of this lecture, there's probably this slide and one other that you will probably want to spend time mastering. Um, and it's not that this one is difficult, it's that uh, it, it's always difficult to discern between, am I talking about the the uh, central nervous system, peripheral, uh, is it sympathetic, parasympathetic? Now you're talking about autonomic, extrinsic, intrinsic. So what I'm encouraging you to do, guys, is to just you know spend several moments and get this kind of organized in your head, so that you know when you say. Uh, GI system is controlled by the autonomic nervous system that you think to yourself, okay, the extrinsic part of that is sympathetic and parasympathetic. The intrinsic part of that is the enteric, which takes us down lower on this page, the intrinsic being uh, the enteric, and it is located in the wall of the track, and its job is to communicate back up there to the extrinsic. And you know, the extrinsic is, is pretty much what you've been hearing about all your life when you talk about fight or flight, rest and digest, right? Um, the fight or flight is the sympathetic. You see the bear. Uh, all these things happen. Cortisol pumps. Your bronchioles dilate. Your eyes dilate. And um, and your body says, you know what, we don't have time to eat right now, so it shunts energy and blood towards your extremity muscles so you can run away from the bear. That's the sympathetic. Parasympathetic is the rest and digest. You, you escape the bear, and now your your body feels that it's time to replenish itself and, and take care of itself. So this is when all the energy goes towards uh, the GI system. Yeah, let me just check over here for any questions. And uh, no, uh, Marie, yours is the first uh, complaint I've had tonight about the sound. I uh, will watch for any others, though. Okay. Now the idea about the intrinsic innovation, guys, is that it is what we call necessary and efficient, or sufficient, necessary and sufficient to operate the GI tract. In other words, 
you don't need the extrinsic to do the job. It's nice. And, and life would be a lot nicer with it. But if you had to, uh, your GI tract would, su would survive just fine with intrinsic innervation. The reason is that intrinsic system controls the smooth muscles, the secretory um, functions, and the endocrine cells. Not much more left, right? <coughs> Pretty much controls everything that needs to be controlled. <coughs> Excuse me. And as we said on the last slide, we said the extrinsic spoke to the intrinsic. It receives input from parasympathetic and sympathetic. And something we hadn't brought up yet, mechanoreceptors and chemoreceptors in the mucosa. So, going, you know, this, this is that part where I'm saying uh, spend a little time memorizing the structure because we're going to keep referring back to it. But mechanoreceptors, uh, yeah, those are in lots of different places in the body. Baroreceptors are sometimes they're called, a barrel being pressure, I can do the uh, carotid arteries. Uh, but barrel receptors are really just mechanoreceptors. They just respond to pressure. And then chemoreceptors. Chemoreceptors are those receptors that uh, respond to increased concentrations of certain uh, chemicals. Uh, we have them in a few places in our body, uh, the ones we talk about. Most are the ones in the brain, um, in the bottom posterior of the fourth ventricle of the brain, the area postrina. It's the area that makes us puke when we eat too much of the wrong thing and have too much of a, a concentration. Uh, we will bring up at least two other kinds of chemoreceptors that act in the GI system. Right? that serve as an early warning signal for when you uh, happen to eat pathogens uh, that are secreting some kind of, of a noxious or toxic substance in your stomach. And let's see, Cecilia says, yes, I am having problems here too, so um, I don't know, I'll put my mouth closer. Let me just double check my input and make sure it's uh, maximized. All right, we'll see if that helps any. My input was on about 75%, and it keeps self-adjusting. Don't do that. Okay. <coughs> All right, let's, uh, let's hope that that's a little better. And everybody else seems to be good to go. All right, thanks, guys. Okay, so let's take up where we left off. Intrinsic innervation, mechanoreceptors, chemoreceptors. Oh, and I should also mention something else. So, um, uh, when I'm when I'm giving a lecture, uh, there's two diversions that I typically make. One of them, you'll hear me say, "Pause on the learning and, and press the play," uh, or "Pause on the knowledge, press the play on the learning," which is to say that I'm about to try to give you a little, I don't know, pearl about how to get a certain piece of knowledge in your head that works for me, and if you like it, keep it, if you don't, throw it away. Uh, the other pause, which is actually not a pause, it's just a segue that I make sometimes, is like just now, when we, you know, we were talking about GI mechanoreceptors and chemoreceptors, and I diverted into this area posturing of the brain where the main ones are. When I talk about something like that, what I'm trying to do, guys, is have some integrated learning going on. But um, my rule, my personal rule, is 
Um, if it's not on the slide, it's not testable. Okay, so I may talk about something like that, so that you might you might say, oh, okay, yeah, that's the same thing, and I'm, I'm trying to show you that it's it's not all so complicated, but uh, you won't be tested on the on the mechano receptors in the brain just because I happen to talk about it. Ready? Okay, so with that, let's go back. And welcome, Sammy. Is it pronounced Sammy or Sammy? Sammy or Sammy? Okay, so here is a, a nice little confusing picture to make it clear as mud what we are talking about. Let's just start up at the top. So to get you oriented, uh, basically we have a drawing that starts at the top, the luminal, the epithelial, if you will, surface of the GI tract, right? This is the mucosa. That kind of makes this area up here the lumen. Right? Food will be coming down through here. And then all these layers are just going deeper and deeper. Oops, sorry about that. Those layers are just going deeper and deeper. So, the idea here is, uh, let me get my pencil. Okay, not much going on in the mucosa. Okay, um, not much going on in the normal, uh, yeah, the normal working uh, functioning system for the mucosa. And it's not much that we care about. Uh, the first action starts to happen when we get to. Oops, sorry, I have no idea why my pen is not working. Okay, let's just be this slide because I know it works. Let me try one more time. Maybe it wants a different color. Let me try backing away, coming back into it. Oh, there we go. Okay. So it's going to dry, so it's not going to turn into a pin. All right, so uh, we just talked about the mucosa. We come down to the next level, that submucosal plexus, right? So now is when we got some stuff happening, right? In this plexus, we have this plexus talking to, communicating, uh, if you will, with endocrine cells up here and those mechano and chemo receptors that we talked about earlier they are talking to the submucosal plexus okay now I know this right now this looks uh, incredibly intimidating and confusing I do appreciate that um, however I want to encourage you that we're going to go over it from about three or four different angles this is just one of them I'm giving this one for those whose learning uh, modalities uh, like this one. If this speaks to you, well, it doesn't speak to me, I can tell you. But if this speaks to you, then this is the picture you should be referring to um, for your learning purposes. All right, so that's it. Uh, <coughs> Submucosal plexus. Uh, and we've got this plexus talking to endocrine cells and being talked to by the mechanoreceptors and the chemoreceptors inside the mucosa. As we go deeper, we have that circular muscle that we talked about. Remember, part of its job is to take part of the peristalsis. It does that because it's going to get signals from up above the submucosal plexus. And it's going to get signals from below the myenteric plexus. So this circular muscle has um, innervation above it 
and below it. Okay. And let's see, that takes us down to the myoteric plexus, which just pretty much talks to everything around it. Lastly being the longitudinal muscle, which is going to take signals from the myoteric plexus because it is also involved in those pulses. All of this, if you want to, you know, pick the center of the universe, if you will, that would be right here in the myenteric plexus because there is a bidirectional communication going on between the parasympathetic and the myenteric plexus and the sympathetic and the myenteric plexus. Okay, so it's well, it's uh, bi-directional, and then once we can get a signal here, then we pretty much get signals all over the place going throughout that those levels of the GI. So, so I'd like to encourage you to learn it that way: is to start from the myenteric plexus as the center of the universe, and then realize that that myenteric plexus. Oops. So I'm just trying to clear it out so you can get a bigger, a better picture. <clears throat> so center of the universe. And then this myenteric plexus pretty much talks to everything, either directly or indirectly. Parasympathetic system, sympathetic systems, uh, it talks to secretory cells, talks to the circular muscle, talks to the submucosal plexus, which indirectly allows it to talk to the mucosa. Okay? So this is where it starts. Start this is your memorization and then just memorize all your layers going upwards. Then you should be fine. Okay. To chat a little bit about the esophagus. So the job of the esophagus is to move food from the pharynx to the stomach. Um, I'm sorry, let me check my messages here. Let's see. Scroll your screen a little bit, please. Can't see below. Longitudinal. Uh, I just I want to see what that looks like. So you on this slide you cannot see below longitudinal muscle. Okay. All right about that. Let me hold on. Let me just. I don't want that to be a, a consistent problem. Mm. Okay, <clears throat> let's just make it a little bit smaller. Okay, how's that? Can you see parasympathetic and sympathetic below the longitudinal muscle now? Okay. Alrighty, good job. Thanks for telling me. Alright, <clears throat> so esophagus. Oh, and well, you know what? Let me just back up because <clears throat> I evidently spent a lot of time talking about something you couldn't see. So my my um, suggestion here was to simply start from the myenteric plexus as the center of the universe. Then you tell yourself my myenteric plexus is going to have bidirectional communication between the parasympathetic and the sympathetic. Once it's got that, then it pretty much talks to all of these layers. Okay, it will talk to all of them directly except for the mucosa, which it talks to indirectly via the submucosa. Okay, so that's the take home message. <coughs> Sorry. Let's see, is that where you feel it in your gut saying and the whole smile is coming through? <laughs> That's good, I like that. That's 
That's integrated learning. I feel it in my gut. <laughs> All right, so esophagus, moving food from pharynx to the stomach. <laughs> what do you know? Inner circular muscle, outer longitudinal muscle. Right? Different language, pretty much the same structure. Inner circular muscle, outer longitudinal muscle. Um, so, you know, whether we're talking about intestines or, or uh, esophagus proper. All right, and here's a picture of what it looks like. So, here's the lumen in red that I'm filling in. All right. And if you've got the lumen there, you have that mucosal level, full of lots of secretion going on through there. Okay. And we're not going to be able to see all of the levels here because of the magnifications. The ones that I want you uh, to be able to appreciate are this one. Let me just color it a little bit like this. Uh, the UCB and colored it red. Which are the circular muscles. And then I'm coloring it again up top. Those are the longitudinals. Those are what I want you to appreciate on this image. Okay, let's look at some photos of the esophagus. Um, Pyrosis, a.k.a. heartburn, um, is, it's just a $20 word for something that everybody already knows. It's about regurgitation of uh, the stomach contents when they come into the lower esophagus. And, uh, for those of you who, who are enrolled in the, the board review class, we'll be talking in this section about you know, things you've heard about, hiatal hernia, sliding hiatal hernia, parasophageal hernia, varus esophagus, esophageal varices, those kinds of things. Um, for the purpose of this class, what I'd like you to uh, be responsible for knowing is the fact that, um, that having regurgitation of stomach contents, and keep in mind we're talking about um, acid that approaches pH levels of 2 being regurgitated into the esophagus. The, the, the cellular structures are not that thick to begin with. They're not that tough. And so what you get is this being the most common cause of esophagitis, just inflammation of the esophageal tissue. And you can appreciate here appreciate the difference, the erythema, and this portion of the esophagus where things have been traveling back up through there versus this portion, nice, smooth, and pink, and healthy. You can appreciate over here, of course, where you're having almost also ulcerative kind of activity going on here. And even look down in there, you can, you know, that's looking really angry down in there. So, yeah, I think you can appreciate the difference in why uh, acid causes esophagitis. Take home message is that um, regurgitation of the stomach contents is the most common cause for esophagitis. All right, that allows us to move down to the stomach. And, excuse me, there are four parts that we're going to be concerned with. Um, the cardia. So the cardia is when it's, it's the entrance to the stomach, the neck, if you will. Um, and as a matter of fact, I kind of think about cardia and pylorus, which is the exit, as the same thing. You know, 
I would have, if I were naming the parts, I'm not, but if I were naming the parts, I would have just given them the same names because the point is that they're, they're, you know, they're, they're an entrance or an exit to the same plot, the same uh, structure. And then the fundus of body, I would also group those together. As a matter of fact, a lot of a lot of people do, right? You hear people talking about body fundus of the snow, where the, the fundus is really that uh, the part superior to the uh, uh, Oh, I also want you to know that the stomach can expand to a level where it can hold three liters uh, of material inside of it. Yes, figure. Um, <clears throat> so what I'm leaving, so I swallowed food, it's coming down my esophagus, right? There's no label here, guys, but this that I'm circling is the cardia, which is why I say it, it's really the same thing as the pylorus, which is over here. It's just talking about the entrance and the exit to the stomach proper. <clears throat> and remember, as we're looking at um, the stomach leans towards the patient's anatomical sex in the body. So you're going to find this part pretty much towards the left hand side of the abdominal cavity. That's it, we have the body fundus, the body's fundus, if you will. And then the body. Okay, and if uh, for our convenience, stripped away to show these muscle layers at uh, some of the ones that we've been talking about, you can appreciate how this external layer right here, those are the, the longitudinal muscles. And then here are the circular muscles here. On the, oops, sorry, I missed that right there. On the more internal layer. And then inside of the skin. Okay, so uh, yeah, so that's that's enough for stomach proper. Audio is not sounding right. Okay, better. Alrighty. <clears throat> I am still in Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Three weeks to go, and I am out of this place. I don't believe I told you guys of my experience about a five-foot snake falling out of the tree above my head last week, uh, which was which was super traumatic compared because four weeks earlier a snake was outside my barracks door as I walked out one night, just laying there minding its own business, waiting for me to leave. <clears throat> and then about a week ago, there I am in the morning about 7 o'clock, walking along and a snake drops out of the tree about 5 feet from where I was standing. In its mouth is still the bird that it had been digesting. Keeping in mind that this bird had to have been twice the size of the snake's head. But the only thing sticking out of the snake's mouth was maybe the last six inches of the bird's foot. The rest of it had been uh, digested. Um, why I'm telling you about that? Thinking about the stomach just made me think about the snake. Thinking about the snake just made me say, I am so glad that I only have three weeks left in this place. <laughs> okay. So let's keep going. Uh, stomach. There's two structures um, that we are going to be concerned with here. Gastric pits, which are no more than openings in the mucosa, guys. So I'm referring back to that. Got to really get it in our heads. So the, the mucosa, that, that more epithelial, the, the side facing the lumen, inside of that structure are just little pits, little openings. Now those little openings are filled by gastric glands. Okay, so 
you know, this is this will not, I promise, be as difficult to visualize as the kidney was. Uh, but you do have to kind of take it slow and think about what it is, um, you know, that, that that I'm saying when we say that um, gastric pits are filled by gastric glands. Um, yeah, so we're, you know, the idea is that those glands are able to secrete um, digestive enzymes and many other things into the pits. Okay, let's see. Okay, did I shoot the snake? No, I did not shoot the snake. They have some really strict laws here about wildlife and wetlands. It's, uh, you're not supposed to cut down any trees. One of, well, one of my barrack mates owns 32 weapons, 25 of which are assault rifles. Uh, the remaining seven are handguns. Um, lives on lives on his only on his own 36 acres of land and has built his own firing range to practice his guns with. I figured I'd get him to shoot it. If I see it again, I, I certainly would. Okay. You, you really appreciated the sound of servants doing that description. <laughs> That's good. Okay, so we just said that, gl that um, glands secrete things into pits. So let's talk about some of the cells that those glands are made of. There are four that we would be concerned with. That will be the mucosal cells or mucus cells, uh, chief cells, and you, that's the ones you probably hear about all the time. And you know, you remember from your undergraduate biology. Um, parietal cells is probably the second most popular one. And then we're also going to talk about the enteroendocrine cells. So, um, that said, let's just take a peek at what this might look like in vivo, um, or at least under glass. So, on the top surface here, right, we have that, that lumen area that we were talking about, the epithelial area. And... You can see that gastric pit right up at the top of the screen. And if you see right, let me get my pen out. Uh, here. Let's see. Right here, gastric pit. Okay. So I have a pit. And what I have are cells that are secreting things into that pit, okay? Cells secreting things into that pit. Let's look at the idealized drawing over here on your right. Gastric pit. Okay. I've got that. These, these are the mucosal cells as I'm following down because they just kind of get invaginated into the pit. And then every now and then, you know what you run into? A G cell. A gastrin secreting cell. And then as you go farther down, you start running into the chief cells, the well, parietal cells right here. And then the chief cells. Okay, so that's what it looks like in in you know in vivo, in real in structure. Um, so try to commit that little picture to your memory because it will help when we start talking about anything that is pathophysiological. Okay. Let's see. You are right. I need to go home to Philadelphia. <laughs> okay, small intestine. Small intestine. Um, 
I'm sorry, I'm pausing because I'm wondering why it's in that order. It should be in the other order. I mean, it doesn't matter when I'm lecturing, but I, when, when I lecture, I like to put things in either order, either a, uh, a, an anatomical order or an order that helps you learn it to memorize it or an order <clears throat> in the order that they occur in a process instead of just throwing things up there. So, uh, yeah, this should be duodenum. Well, what did I have here? We got duodenum, jejunum, ileum. Now, what do I have on the next one? Okay, so we're good. All right, so we're going to talk about um, in detail the job of the duodenum or duodenum, the jejunum and the ileum, aka small intestine. Uh, primarily, the job is to digest and absorb the food that you eat. So basically, you know, in the small intestines, the body is going to take away the nutrients, and in the large intestine, this is going to add water, so they can prepare to get to get rid of it. The small intestine is also that area where the bile duct and the pancreatic duct empty into the duodenum. The bile duct, which is connected to the gallbladder, which is responsible for breaking down fat, emulsifying uh, fat. Um, and then the, the uh, pancreas, which is responsible for quite a few things. The one that we'll be concerned about uh, doing this particular module will be its digestive enzymes. And uh, keeping in mind that you know, the pancreas is a powerful thing, the pancreas. It, 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 when things go wrong and you have pancreatitis or, or, um, or pank, some kind of tumor or pancreatic uh, cancer uh, or hypercalcemia, uh, sometimes the pancreas just kind of goes crazy and, you know, its job is to secrete digestive enzymes. And if it doesn't have anything there to digest and it's just keeps secreting digestive enzyme, it starts to auto-digest, which that's an amazing concept to me, that it will do its job even to the extent that it digests itself, if it has to. Uh, but we'll talk about uh, more of those situations later. Okay, uh, let's see. So this is just a picture of the parts that we've been talking about, and we have the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum. We have a, a, a blow up here, if you will, uh, of those two ducks that I was just talking about. Let me get it on my pencil. Okay, so this patient is facing you. Their stomach kind of right here. Okay. Yes, I'm a terrible artist, but uh, sorry. So their stomach is kind of there, we've got chyme, C-H-Y-M-E, that gets created in, in the stomach. Um, as it leaves, it will uh, go into the duodenum, the chyme, and now notice as it passes this first part of the duodenum, there's like four parts to it. As it passes this first part, is where you have 
the common bile duct coming down here because when food gets presented to the first part, the common bile, that gallbladder receives a signal that it needs to contract and send some enzymes through here. Okay. You also, you can appreciate right here, the pan pancreatic duct. So food that has been traveling through this duodenum, exposed uh, to the contents of the gallbladder, now they get into the second part of the duodenum. Now they are exposed to pancreatic digestive enzymes, keep on going through the third and the fourth part until they make it out to the rest of the system. Okay, so this photo right here, guys, is worth uh, it's worth spending a few moments memorizing uh, for a couple of reasons. When you get questions, um, I'm trying to think of the kinds of questions that you get that can be answered by this photo. One of them, uh, yeah, yeah, you'll get anatomy questions that will give you all kinds of distractors, but what they're really asking is, which one does food get exposed to first? Gallbladder contents or pancreatic contents? Okay, you can see it's gallbladder. Uh, they'll ask, um, at what part, uh, in, in, in which part of the duodenum does food get exposed to uh, pancreatic enzymes? Um, they will, what's another good one? Yeah, there's always that question about where the head of the pancreas is. Uh, remember my little deity is this to uh, head right here, which is the head of the pancreas points to the right. Uh, it also implies that, you know, you know where your gallbladder is. Uh, so you can pretty much kind of put your finger on your duodenum because it's just inferior to it. And the head of the pancreas is just inferior to that. So that'll give you some, you know, some localizing um, um, geography to be able to talk about that. Okay, let's see. We've got about seven minutes left. Where am I? I think I'm getting to the, yep, it's where I thought I was. Okay, so week one lecture stops here. Um, so next week we are going to pick up with, I think there's what, here, like one or two more slides about the small intestine. And then we're going to look at some structures. Yes, yeah, so we got about three slides left on the small intestine. Then we'll go into the large intestine next week. We keep working our way down, just like a piece of food. Uh, let me think. Any admin things that I have not covered yet? Uh, we're going to send this to the admin tonight. And, yep, I do believe that is it. All right, guys. I know you can't believe it. I can't believe it. You've wasted another perfectly good 90 minutes of your lives with me. And um, I hope you had fun talking about the stomach, the GI, and everything else that's going to come afterwards. We will pick this up where we left off next week. So I am wishing you a happy week, a better weekend, and I'll see you in a little over six days, guys. Have a wonderful night out there. Bye-bye. The organizer has ended the session and this call will be disconnected. Goodbye.